In October of 2005, on the fifth floor intensive care unit of the Duke University Medical Center, there was a woman in critical care. Uh, she had uh, slowly deteriorated over the years, had, had, had a collapsed lung, a lack of appetite. Uh, she weighed too much for her knees to easily handle a uh, feeding tube. She had a uh, tube in her side to deal with a, a MRSA issue, a multiple resistant Staphylococcus aureus, a rather nasty uh, infection that doesn't respond well to antibiotics. And so uh, she had gone into sepsis once. Is anyone, who here has seen, it, seen what it looks like when you go into sepsis or septic shop? So, oh, yes, check. Uh, so you know what it looks like, right? The whole body starts to turn blue, and it is creepy. It is really kind of scary. Your whole body, it, 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 the bacterial infection load of your body gets so high, the whole system just starts shutting down. And your only hope, as far as I understand it, I am not having a medical opinion here, just to be clear, but it is to uh, lots of antibiotics and pray. And uh, she had gotten through this, of the first one, but she was just whooped. She needed to eat and to walk, and she was afraid to get up out of bed because she didn't want to fall. Um, again, not having a medical opinion, but it is my guess that she was dealing with some clinical depression as well. Now, the reason I knew her is that I had been her chaplain for months at that point. I was a chaplain for that part of the hospital. <coughs> and. Um, Actually, I wasn't the chaplain for that part of the hospital. I had met her in passing, and she had sort of glommed on to me because no one else seemed to give her the space to just be honest and, and straight about the situation she was in, and it was hard. Like, and so she complained, as I would too, right? And so she ranted. She was angry at God, and she wanted to talk about it. And so I sat and listened. Sometimes the, the first gift of the church is just to listen. And, and so I, I sat and I listened and we talked about this and that's okay to be angry. And over time she uh, told me about her family. She had raised a son and a daughter and she didn't, in, in retrospect, they're both adults at, the, at that point, she didn't think she'd done a good job. She, in retrospect, thought that she had driven them away. And uh, her son lived two hours away and was a psychiatrist. Uh, but had really hadn't talked to his mom in years. And then her, her uh, daughter lived there in Durham and, and had her own daughter, a two-year-old granddaughter, that this woman had never met. And so it's a kind of a hard family situation. And so she asks me to contact her kids on her behalf, and, and so we talked about what I could do, and, and I, I went ahead and called them. And, and the, they got together, the three of them, the mother, the son, and the daughter, and they were the first time in years they got together and uh, it's not like everything was just better. Like, there was still a problem. The, um, the granddaughter couldn't come. You cannot have a two-year-old in the same room with someone with a MRSA infection. It, it would be very dangerous for the child. But uh, it, was, it was a step toward, it was better. Right? It was getting better. And then the infection came back, and it came back really strong. And the kids, who have just seen their mom for the first time in years, they get called in, and they start having the dance. You've been part of this or seen it, I'm sure. The dance when they've got to figure out what they're going to do. And it was made harder because this woman had not made it clear what she wanted. She didn't have a living will. There was no like directives or anything like that. And so uh, I, I got there. Or we were sitting in this cold, sterile consultation room. All white, very clean. And I got there first. I sat down at, my, at one end of the table. And then uh, the two doctors came in. They sat over there. And then the, the daughter and the son came in. And they sat over there. Like away from me. I thought, huh, that's odd. The daughter didn't say a word the entire time. She like completely checked out. No response, just nothing. And the, and the doctors and the son, they start talking. And he's a trained psychiatrist, so he can talk medical talk. And, and so they're, they're talking, dork, 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 right? They're, they're talking using all the lingo uh, of the medical field. And uh, I'm following along, um, but it, it's just this... 
it was a hard, hard conversation. Like they're trying to figure out, she hadn't said what she wanted. Should they go to like a hospice thing and just let it fade, let her, let her fade? Or should they try everything they can? Or should they do like something in between, do antibiotics in a feeding tube, but let's not code, let's not do the full CPR, crash cart, whole nine yards. And uh, she wanted to get better. She had told me she wanted to get better to see her granddaughter, but she, that hadn't happened yet. And so as they're questioning and exploring th this, I spoke up. And I said, I, I'm this lady's chaplain. I have been for a while now, and I know her to be a baptized Christian. I, and, I and I think, I said, I think we should consider this from the point of view of a Christian. She is a baptized Christian, part of the body of Christ, and she does not fear death. She knows her Lord. And I wanted to go on and say a few more things. I, I was just finishing up seminary. I had a lot to say. I wanted to go on and say a few more things about how uh, this life has a start and the end, and we not, need not fear the end because Jesus had already walked this life and, and, and showed us that death is not the final victor. I wanted to talk to say something about how we, we all eat at this table together, and that binds us together as one body, and so we have a say in how we, each other live because we are all connected. I wanted to say some more, but I didn't. Because as I was starting this, uh, the three of them, their heads pivoted and they looked at me simultaneously like I had suddenly started speaking Swahili. I have never felt so looked down upon or stupid in my entire life. Like that, that whole line Paul talks about being a fool for Christ, I have never felt it until, like fully experienced it till that moment where they looked down at me like, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? And, and they just ignored me. And they looked back to each other, and they because obviously they needed to wrap this up so this loony dude at the end of the table stopped talking. Okay, sounds like we'll just do antibiotics. Sounds good to me. And done. Break. Gone. And, uh, and I... I go back and I pray with the woman, and uh, and that that's the and I, I finished up my rotation as a chaplain shortly thereafter. I don't know how this unfold. I don't know the end of the story. The reason I tell you about that story is to bring up this sort of modern assumption that we have about our bodies and who owns them and what happens to them. The modern assumption is that we own them much the same way that we own our car, right? What happens to my car? Whatever I choose. My car, I mean, if I want to paint, paint it pink, I, I can paint it pink, right? My car, my, my possession, my thing, right? It is my, I have rights to it, my possession. Have you noticed that the Bible never actually uses the, words, the word rights? That it's not in scripture? It is not. Right? You know what God has to say about our bodies? Isaiah 43, I have called you by name, and you are mine. And it's not like the you are mine of an evil villain, wah ha ha ha, I, I'm in control here. It is you are mine, and I will walk through fire and through the waters, so you will not be overwhelmed. I will gather all of my people, you who are made for my glory, I will call from the ends of the earth, for you are mine. It's a gift, right? It is surprising to say this, to hear this, but this is what God says, and I think we, we need to pay attention to it. Now, what would have happened if we had paid attention to it in that room, talking the, the those of us, the doctors, the son, uh, the daughter? Like, would it have been different? I don't know, but it would have sounded... Uh, well, it w I don't know if we would have come out in a different place, but it sure would have sounded different. Because in retrospect, what it sounded like was a bunch of peep mechanics discussing how to take care of a car. It's like someone dropped off a car at the shop without giving directions, and they, said, and they were trying to figure out, should we give them a tire rotation and a oil change or just the oil change like what, what do we do what's the services we need to perform upon this car what are the what are the services we need to perform upon this body what do you think the owner would want no that's not the discussion we would have had if we had started with the discussion saying this woman is a child of God and God has claimed this woman and she does not fear what is going to happen next if we had talked about her hope that she was headed towards resurrection, the kingdom of God, in which we, she would see her granddaughter yet again. 
And she would get there, whether she went there soon or she went there later. And she woke back up and she was going to walk through the fires of physical therapy. It doesn't feel good, right? If she was going to have to figure out how to get up and walk, she would not walk alone. For God says, I will walk with you through the fires and through the waters. If we had talked about her like a person and a child of God, it would have been a far different conversation. Like, I don't know if we would have ended up differently. But it would have mattered. Now, how else be, does being claimed by God change how we make these de decisions, right? If we ask people why they do what they do, often it's rooted in a sense of my body, my life, my decisions. I can do what I want, eat what I want, go where I want, work where I want. And yet God says, you are mine, that we are not our own, that God has bought us with a price and is committed to walking with us because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. Isaiah 43, 4. Now, there are many people and organizations that will make claims upon us. Right? We just hit, uh, who here pays quarterly taxes? Right? IRS will claim, your, claim our money, won't it? Just claim the whole chunk of mine. Our jobs will claim our time. Our families will claim our attention. Our economy will claim us as consumers. But before any other claim happens, God claims all of us and changes how every other claim works. God has plans for us, for our time, our money, our lives, for everything. And, and so that changes how we live because when we gather, what, what, in a sense what we're doing when we gather for worship is we are listening, listening to God's claim upon us. And if God's claim upon us is for our entire person, there is nothing the church doesn't have a say about in us. Right? There is nothing that we cannot or should not talk about from this pulpit. That doesn't apply to every part of our lives and every part of my life. As you may have noticed, my sermons are usually for me, because I need to hear them, you happen to be in the room. Because I, I got my own struggles, right? What is more, God says, I have called you by name. When God calls us as his, it's not like a farmer taking a delivery of 30 head. Uh, you don't, you're taking 30 head of cattle, you don't name every one. Uh, we call that one Nancy and Fred and George. No, you, you just take 30 head. And that, that's not quite how it works here. It's not like, well, I'll just take a church. No, God calls us by name. God calls us by, you know, think about what it means to be called by your first name, the familiarity there, to be called by the last name, that I know who you are, and I know your family, and I know your background, and I know what that means, right? To say that God calls us by name is to say that God knows us and claims us. And that's what we celebrate today when Jesus is baptized. God the Father says that you are my son. With you I am well pleased. You are part of this family. I call you by name. And God calls us in the same way in our baptisms. It is in our baptisms that we go, we touch the waters that God has blessed and we say, yes God, I am yours. And we acknowledge that. Just as Jesus did in his baptism. And in his baptism, that's when he commits to all the ministry that will come. To walking through the fires and the waters that swirl around him. That is, after Jesus is baptized, he didn't know where the fire would take him or the waters would swirl. He didn't know where he would end up. We don't, end up, we don't know where we will end up in baptism either. Right? We don't know where we're going to end up. Just like in the same way that when you get married, do you have any clue who you're really marrying? Like how, how long does it take before your spouse stops surprising you? How long does it, or like having kids, how, do you really know what you're getting into when you have kids? No. You get baptized, do you really know what you just did? No. No, you don't. But God says that God will walk with you through whatever it is, calling you by name, and in the end, gathering us together as his people. As a people who follow Jesus until that time, and we follow him being named sons and daughters of God, we acknowledge that we are gods, that we go into ministry, and it's going to be interesting and weird and unexpected, but God walks with us, before us, and behind us. And that what happens next after baptism, when, when the adventure begins, when the crowds gather and the miracles happen and the disciples will be formed, the world will be changed, that it all begins with baptism. That call, God calls us by name and claims us in the water of baptism, and that is where we acknowledge that we are gods, and that, that is a very good thing to be. Amen.